You know, uh, I'm just going to jump right in here. I'm going to go full speed ahead because I got something I want to tell you, my friend. Let's do it. Bring it on. I, I only just met you for the first time back in June. You and I were both speakers at a conference in Montreal. And man, you left an impression upon me right away, right out of the gate. You're the kind of guy I need more of in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Hey, like, likewise, dude. That's why we connected immediately. I mean, yeah, right. man. I just, you know, you're, you're a guy, you're high energy, you're enthusiastic, you're full of it. You, you're just full of spunk, man. And, you know, we need more people like that in this world. And I love being around people like you. So I'm so happy to have made your acquaintance. And I hope there's lots of fun stuff for us to work out in the future. Yes, I totally agree. And I, I really appreciate those kind words, man. I echo the sentiment entirely. Let me let me bring over so everyone can see. This is uh, Sean's Twitter profile. This is kind of how we connect um, pretty frequently. He's also a huge Gator fan as long as well as me. Go Gators. Yeah, go Gators. Um, but you also, you are a trader and you are a market strategist at Trade Ideas. So I figured this would be the perfect time just to bring you on and just kind of find out more about what you do, what trade ideas is going through, what your, your, what your trading strategies are. Just talk trading with you, man. Sure, man. Happy to. I mean, I've been trading since 1998, so it, it's in my blood uh, for better or for worse. Uh, anyone who's been in this business a long time knows that it's not all up and to the right uh, with trading <laughs> as much as we'd like it to be. Yeah. Um, I, I've certainly had my ups and my downs, um, but uh, look, everything's a learning experience and uh uh, at least later in life, in my trading life, uh, I've certainly found ways to, uh, you know, maybe view the downsides of trading in, in more positive light and, and turn it turn lemons into lemonade. So it's a it's a journey, as you well know, and then the people you educate and train, I'm sure, will all relate. Yeah, totally. So 1998, what was that like, man? How, how'd you get started in that world? Well, I know you were still in kindergarten at that time. Yeah, so. pretty much. <laughs> That's cool. <Just> about. <laughs> 1998 was a, it was a, it was a different time. Um, you know, the internet was still very new. Um, I mean, I, I joke, but this is absolutely true. Uh, the internet basically started when I was in college. My freshman year, when I showed up to freshman orientation at college, one of the first things we had to do was sign up for an email address. And I was like, what the hell is email? What is this? I don't yeah. know what it means. <laughs> and uh, so it was all completely new. And uh, so I had never had any exposure to the, anything internet until my freshman year of college. And that's kind of when it all started. And that was in 1993. Fast forward to 1998 when I started trading, uh, you know, internet brokers were just beginning you first had i think it was day tech and e-trade were the first two uh, that i could think of schwab might have had some electronic trading at the time um but uh it was a different type of market one that we've never seen since one that didn't never existed before and one that yeah. certainly hasn't happened since um in in the late 90s when i started that was when we finally were about to have the uh the final blow off top of the great 90s bull market and especially the dot com bull market. You, you could see, look at that spike right there. Oh, you're looking wow. at E Trade. Okay, right. Yeah. Well, E Trade was part of it there in 1999. That, I mean, that's what every stock looked like in 1999, believe it or not. It was crazy, Jeremy. I mean, I, I, can't, even, I can't even explain it to someone who wasn't even like remotely connected to markets at that time to really try to drive home what markets were like. But stocks, moved up, you know, hundreds of dollars in a day sometimes, some of the more expensive stocks. Dude, I, that's insane, man. Like I had one, one guy, uh, you probably know him, Dennis Dick. Um, he's, sure, one yeah. of my, he's one of my trade mentors. And he told, he told me, he goes, okay, so do you remember Tilray, Jeremy? I was like, yeah, I remember Tilray. So, you know, Tilray. And he was like, imagine oh, yeah. that but every day. <laughs> no, right. that's, how, that's how Yahoo and eBay and Amazon, that's how all those trades, all those stocks traded at the time. It that's was crazy. Insanity. And like, this is the thing that people who are relatively new to trading, this is a concept that they're, they're probably not familiar with, but the S&P futures does have a, a limit up and limit down right now, which we've rarely ever seen anymore. Limit up, limit down means, you know, if the S&P were to go up, I don't know. I don't even know what the number is. Let's say 150 handles today or drop 150 handles. The exchange ceases trading for 10 minutes or maybe it's five minutes. I forget what the time is, but they stop trading and then resume five minutes later to prevent any runway move, runaway moves. Well, in the late 90s, in 99, 2000, 2001, we had limit moves in the S&P almost every day. 
It was, <laughs> and that was normal. Wow. Like we traded based on expecting, okay, when's the limit up going to happen or when's the limit down going to happen? Okay. I'm, 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 I'm shorting everything because we're about to run into limit down. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was a strategy and it was, I mean, shit from in certain days and especially in 2000 when the market topped I and mean, we had limit down days like every day for three weeks straight. I wow. mean, it was insanity and yeah. but you have them living up as well. I mean, so, so what I tell people when I started in the late nineties, like it was a, absolutely a trial by fire and i started in a room with 50 other traders or 40 other traders and every one of us were completely green we had no idea what we were doing none of us had any stock market experience we were all learning together um, for good and bad and uh the, the crazy thing with the benefit of hindsight now is that you know at that time since we were all new to the markets I mean, we recognize that historical moves were happen, happening in certain stocks, but we just thought that this was what trading was. We thought this was normal. And that's the kind of environment in the world that we grew up in as traders. And we soon found out, you know, to, fast forward to 2002, 2003, when the market's more or less normalized, mm. a lot of the guys like myself who grew up in that environment, we had a hard time adapting because all these rules and techniques and, and strategies that we learned in the late 90s that were very profitable, those, <laughs> those tricks didn't work in what turned out to be a normal market later on. And uh, it, was a, it was a hard adjustment. I, I, I joke about this all the time, but it's absolutely true. I've been trading for 21 years and I've literally spent the last 16 of my years or 17 of my years unlearning all the bad habits that I learned. In my first <laughs> Oh man, which so, so did did you do well in the tech move or? Um, in dollar terms, I had my best years in 99, 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. I've had better percentage gain returns in years since, mm. but I was trading with bigger money. There was bigger money to be made yep. back then. And uh, so in dollar terms, I've never even come close. I mean, there were, shit, I was... I'm not saying this to brag and I'm because I was probably the low man, one of the low men in the totem pole in my office, yeah. but you know, I was having many months where I was making 40, 50, 60, $70,000, right. which to a 24 year old kid was like, yeah, of course. whoa, <laughs> especially in the nineties too. It's like, that's insane. Right. But I had guys in my office that were pulling down, you know, six figures a month. I mean, it was, it was crazy. And these were 20 year old kids that were, you know, mid twenties kids. It was a wild time, Jeremy. It's hard to explain it. Wow. 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 Um, what got you into trading there? Like, what was that? Why, why the markets? You know, I, you know, I, I've meditated on this question a lot in recent years. Um, growing up, I, uh, I was, I always had an interest in the stock market, but in a different way. Like I always thought that I was going to grow up to become a stockbroker. <laughs> because that's really all I knew about Wall Street. Like I, I'd seen movies and, you know, all the stuff that people grew up with in the 80s, right? Wall Street, the movie came out in 87. I was 12 years old then. So I thought a stockbroker is how you got involved in Wall Street. I didn't really understand anything about trading or what trading was, or I didn't know what the people on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange did. But I just had this nebulous idea that I want to go where the money is and the stock market is where the money is and looks like stockbroker is the people who make all the money. That, that was what I thought. Mm -hmm. And I should maybe put some context around that. I, you know, I grew up pretty poor. I'm not saying this is a sad story or anything like that, but you know, I come from a family, divorced parents and my mother was a single mother raising three kids. You know, you've heard that whole song and dance mm -hmm. before. Uh, and there was just no money for anything. I mean, we got by and there was always food on the table and, you know, we had a, a, a comfortable house and a nice suburb to live in, but I mean, there was no money left over for other things. So sure. I probably grew up with an unnatural um, craving for money because of that, thinking that money's going to solve all my problems. Uh, so wanting to get involved in Wall Street, thinking stock brokerage was the way. And so I've always been interested in the stock market. And my first job out of college uh, a friend of mine was working at MetLife and he got me involved as a job to sell mutual funds at MetLife, my first job out of college. Now, <laughs> working at MetLife for a newly graduated college graduate is probably the worst idea. And this, I'm not picking on MetLife. This is just this industry in general. Mm -hmm. Probably the worst job for a recent college graduate ever because in that job, your success depends on your network mm -hmm. and the people you know. Well, 
all the people I knew were also other recent college graduates who, if they had $40 left over at the end of the month, it was getting blown at happy hour on Friday, right? Right. <laughs> they didn't have, they weren't thinking about investing or anything like that. So I spent six months at MetLife attempting to sell mutual funds, uh, struggled mightily, as you might imagine, and basically quit because I was like, this isn't working for me. Yeah. But it definitely got me more interested in the stock market. I learned a lot more about it. Um, and one of the guys I worked with, uh, he found an article, I think it was in Forbes or Fortune, and it was an article about the new Soze Bandits, if, you, that's a familiar, if that's a term that's familiar to you. In the late 90s, they were the precursors to the common day trader that we all know. Mm. And I found it fascinating. Let's talk about all the money they were making. So, of course, I'm interested because I'm hearing about people making money. Um, so, I became nebulously aware of the fact that trading is something that people do and you can make money at it and it's a career. And when I decided to leave MetLife, my father was living in Tampa, Florida at the time. Again, my parents were divorced and my, I was living in Buffalo myself at the time. That's my hometown. But my father was living in Tampa and uh, he said to me when I quit my job, he's like, well, if you have no job now, if you want to move down to Florida and find a new job, you know, you could live with me while you get your, you know, get your feet settled, you know, whatever. Um, come on down. And <laughs> it was early March in Buffalo, New York, which you're a Southern guy. You don't know what that's like. No, Trust me. no it's idea. cold and gray <laughs> and miserable. So the thought of moving to Florida in March. Wow. That sounded like a wonderful, wonderful idea. Yeah. Um, so I moved to Tampa, Florida. Side note, that's how my love of the Florida Gators began was yeah. when I moved to Tampa and got exposed to all that. But anyway, going back to trading, I got a job. The first job I found in Tampa was this job that, oh man, in hindsight, I cringe even talking about it. But it was like one, you know, how, it's like one degree removed from a true bucket shop. Mm. You've seen the movie, um, uh, well, what's it? Boiler Room. You've seen that movie, Boiler Room, right? Yep where it's like all these high pressure sales guys, you know, trying to rip, rip customers off. Right. Yep. So I wasn't in that environment, but it was pretty damn close. I found a job working for a company that what they did was instead of calling customers and trying to sell them on some shitty penny stock, instead we called brokers and sold brokers on shitty penny stocks and tried to get them to get their customers. <laughs> so we yeah. didn't have to have a license to do that, blah, blah, blah. Look, I mean, as I'm older and I understand how the world works a little better now, I realize that, wow, what a scam, what a shady operation this was. I can't believe I did this. I would never do this now. But at the time I was 21 years old, I had no job and this was like, hey, this was the stock market. I could get involved. So it, it, I got interested. So I worked this job in this bucket shop thingy in Tampa, Florida, and uh, worked with like 10 other guys. And um, again, further got me more interested in the stock market. I'm learning more about how stocks work and how they trade and all this. And um, there was a guy that I became friends with who, that sat next to me in my office uh, who a little, little smarter than me, a little more seasoned, and he knew, he knew much more about trading than I did. And he had found out that there was a, trading firm located just three doors down from us on, uh, on the street that we worked. Um, this was uh, back in the day in the late nineties, these things were popping up all over the place. People, some people called them trading arcades. Some people called them prop shops, but essentially these were offices where you come up, you, you bring $50,000 to the table. They will hook you up with all the computers and technology you need. They'll give you super cheap commissions. Well, super cheap in those days. Yeah. And high speed internet, which this sounds funny to some, you know, some of you millennials. Though. That was crazy. This sounds funny to some of you millennials, but you know, going to a trading office was the only place you could find high speed internet because nobody mm -hmm. had, everyone had dial up at their house in the late nineties. So these offices provided a service. You, you basically, they gave you everything you need, computers, high speed internet, cheap commissions, and you open an account there and you trade it and you know, you kept your profits or you ate your losses. That was it. And the house kept a commission. Mm. So we found this, my, my buddy learned that this place existed and he said, Hey, let's go down there on our lunch break. Let's check it out. I'm like, all right, sure. 
So, uh, so we walked out of this office, we knock on a door or we open up the office door thinking we're going to walk into like this reception room and there'll be like a, <laughs> a receptionist or a secretary or somebody. No, <laughs> what happened was we opened the door and we basically walk right onto the trading floor and it's like <laughs> a room where there's like, at the time there were maybe 15 guys all staring at computer screens, all relatively quiet and nobody acknowledged us. We just walked in and we stood there and what felt like an hour was probably 30 seconds, but it felt like an hour. We just stood there expecting somebody to come talk to us and nobody came talk to us. And we're like, what the fuck are we doing here? And eventually someone's like, Hey, can I help you? You guys look lost. <laughs> and my buddy's like, is this a trading firm? And someone's like, yeah, hold on. Let me send the guy over. And as much as some guy comes around the corner, it's the, the, the owner of the office. Uh, his name's Matt. Matt comes over real nice. And he's like, Hey guys, how can I help you? And, Long story short, my friend says he's interested in trading and I was like, okay, great. Well, hey, come on over here. We got a, we got a couple desks, some computers set up with a demo account. Uh, let me show you how this works. And the guy sits down. He's like, this is the buy button. This is the sell button. This is a chart. You want to buy stocks going up and sell stocks going down. Knock yourselves out. It's, it's fake money. Go ahead. Play around. <laughs> and so we did. And I mean, it's, it's hilarious, but like the thing was so rigged at the time that like it made it so easy to think you can make money. Like we were sitting there playing around like a video game and we made like $10,000 on paper. Yeah, yeah. We're like, oh, this is awesome. This is so fun. And so we start talking to the guy a little bit more and he gives us the breakdown. He's like, oh, so you need 50 grand to open up an account. And for me, that's a no-go. But my friend actually had that money. He, um, his wife, he was married at the time. Well, he's still married, but he was married. And uh, his wife, a couple of years prior, had been in some kind of car accident. She was totally fine, totally fine. But there was a lawsuit. She won it. They made some money. And so they had, he had a bunch of money burning a hole in his pocket. <laughs> so he had 50 grand. And so he was definitely interested. He's like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. And, um, you know, he kind of got that process in order. And, and as he was going through the paperwork or whatnot, we were invited to come back every day on our lunch break and play around in the demo and, and, and do the thing and, and, and practice. So my friend was doing that. Meanwhile, I was just coming along for fun because I didn't have any money. And the, the guy that owned the office is like, Sean, you, you know, you seem interested in this. He's like, uh, how come you're not opening an account? And I pulled out my wallet and showed him the $5 I had in my wallet. And I said, this is all the money I have in my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> this is all of it. <laughs> yeah. And he goes, he goes, he's totally cool. About it. He's like, oh no, I get it. Totally cool, man. No worries. He's like, you're welcome to come back anytime you want and hang out with Kenny. Kenny was my buddy who was opening the account. You can hang out Kenny anytime you want. You're welcome to play around on the demo machine. You know, you're, you're always welcome here. I was like, great, thanks. And so it was like a two week process for Kenny to get his account open. And so every day on our lunch break at that shitty brokerage boiler room job we were working, we'd go over there on our lunch break and demo trade for an hour. Mm -hmm. And um, after like two weeks and my friend's about ready to open up his account, uh, the, the, the owner of the office, Matt, comes back to me again and says, hey, Sean, he's like, you've been coming here every day for two weeks. He's like, you seem really interested in this. You seem like a smart guy. What if I told you I knew a guy who put up 50 grand for you to trade and you would just split your profits with him 50-50? Like, would you be interested? And I was like, I will start tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, immediately. Yeah, and that's basically how I got started in trading. I quit my job immediately and started with my friend. And Kenny and I started this thing together and, uh, and that's how we got started. It was was that it's not Kenny Glick, was it? No, I wish. Okay. I love Kenny. <laughs> I was just, that's the only Kenny I knew. I was just wondering. I no yeah, idea. no, no. My, my friend Kenny no longer trades, unfortunately, but he's still living great down in Tampa or St. Pete he lives and a great gotcha. friend of mine. I still talk to him every once in a while. He's awesome. Well, dude, here's a good question because you and I were laughing about this the other day because there was um, a trader who you know, pumps up his stuff and was doing sim trading. And you, you were mentioning that like it was like a video game. Why – in your opinion, is simulated trading so much easier than real money trading? Well, the example that I listed before, uh, it was a little bit stacked. Um, think, here's another thing that was different about the market back then, Jeremy, that you may not have experienced, but mm. um, the way the NASDAQ level two machine, level two window used to work was like the level two, if you look at a level two on any stock or ETF right now, all you see is seven or eight exchanges, right? You see Arca, Inca, mm -hmm. 
bats, whatever. Those are just anonymous exchanges, right? And they're moving yep. friggin' 100 miles an hour. Yep. Well, when we started back in the 90s, it was completely different. On, in the, on, the, on the bid and ask side of the level two screen, you saw who was buying and how much they were buying or selling. So it was, you'd see Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, uh, Bank of America. You'd see every major Wall Street player. You saw who it was and you saw the exact amount they were buying or selling. No, no hiding order flow, no showing 100 shares when you're actually trying to buy 100,000 shares, no games like that. It was very transparent. And it was amazing. And for us traders who learned how to read that tape, we could, you know, we could figure out who the ax was. If, if Morgan Stanley was on the bid on a certain stock, you knew, okay, this thing ain't going down. Morgan Stanley's buying a bunch, right? Mm. You could lean against them. You could kind of jump ahead of them and know that if, if you want to get out, you could always sell it to Morgan Stanley because they're on the bid, right? Right. So with that, when we were doing the SIM trading, you would see all the, the, the bid and ask, uh, uh, all the bids and asks. And the way that we could game it as SIM traders was, this is what would happen. Let's say uh, uh, everyone's on the offer at the same price, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, 20 different brokers are all offering at the same price. Well, if they're all getting filled on their cells, all of a sudden you'd see all of those offers disappearing rapidly and there'd be like one guy left still showing that price. And in the SIM, you could just hit a button and boom, you'd get filled at that price. Even though in the real world, <laughs> the chance of you getting that fill is very low because they uh -huh. could only fill so many and everyone's trying to hit that same guy at the same time. And so we could game it and get that fake fill and then immediately flip it when the bid gets raised to the next guy at I a see. higher price. So it wasn't quite sim trading the way we think of sim trading now. With sim trading now, it's, you know, it's more or less closer to reality. Um, so I, I hate to make the comparisons. I, I think yeah. sim trading now for people who are new to trading uh, or, or want to experiment with different strategies, um, is a, it can be a very good thing. And, and, and look, I'm an experienced trader. I have a, I have a paper trading account. I use it all the time because I'm, I'm a serial tinkerer with strategies. Mm. I love coming up with new ideas. I mean, it's, it's a blessing and it's a curse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I'm always like, brainstorming on new strategies, usually with options trading. And, uh, and I'll use a simulated trader or account. Uh, I use Thinkorswim, which is real easy. And I'll use that to like, you know, practice these strategies and, you know, do them for a month and see how it works out. I mean, I'm, I'm always doing that. So there's value in it for sure. Got it. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. And when you're talking about your strategies, what is your strategy now? If you could describe it, like, what do you look for? What's your kind of go-to uh, good question. I have kind of two strategies um, that I employ. Well, one is um, uh, like a personal strategy I just do on my own is uh, with S&P 500 options, uh, typically SPY options, but sometimes I'll do SPX options. Um, but I employ a, a what I call a long gamma strategy uh, where I'm trying to be delta neutral. I don't care if the market goes up or down. Uh, but I'm long a balanced portfolio of calls and puts. And as the market moves, I'm kind of scalping around it. So for example, if, uh, if, uh, if I'm Delta neutral at the moment, meaning I have a, you know, an equal amount of calls and puts just to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. uh, and my Delta is approximately neutral. If the S&P were to rally significantly today, my long gamma portfolio will take on additional long deltas, right? Yep. And so what I'll do is, out of my portfolio, I will either sell some of my long calls that are making money to bring my delta back to neutral, or I might buy some new puts. Either way, both of those get me back to delta neutral and I'm buying puts low and hopefully selling them more expensive later on. And it's kind of like a swing saw or a swing set, just kind of go back and forth. I'm kind of gamma scalping the position. And the thought for me, and by the way, this is a strategy that's a, a work in progress for me. I haven't perfected it the way I want it to, but the thought with this is when the markets are moving back and forth, not really having a whole lot of direction, as we swing back and forth, when I'm, and I'm quote unquote gamma scalping, I'm doing that to kind of offset the theta decay that's inherent in long options um, and just kind of waiting for one of those big moves to happen because it's the big moves where I get paid. Mm -hmm. So if I can gamma scalp around that long 
gamma long or delta neutral position while the markets are more or less sideways and doing that and offsetting my theta a little bit. So my cost of carry of the position is minimized. Then when we get, you know, a big move like we had in early October, we see those two big down days. Um, you know, those are the days I get paid and that's, that's kind of my, my process. And every once in a while you get lucky. We have a major dislocation and, um, my strategy definitely relies on luck, but it's luck where I'm putting myself in position to be lucky. There's a difference. Yeah. There's a difference between random blind luck, like winning the lottery and crafting a strategy that puts you in position so that when those random events happen that you can't necessarily predict, but they happen on a fairly predictable frequency, when they happen, you benefit from them. Yeah, because the, I mean, it's, 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 so you're kind of also doing a straddle or is it a strangle? Like, or do you have out, out, out of, options out of the money or in the money? So when I buy options, I tend to buy the 25 Delta options. So 25 okay. Delta calls or 25 yep. Delta puts. But if you were to look at the risk reward profile of my trade, my open position at any one time, it will take on what will appear to be a long straddle profile. Mm. Makes sense. Does that make sense? Yep, makes tons of sense. And so are you only focusing on the SPX and the SPY when you're doing this or is it on individual? For this strategy well? currently, yes. I'm just spoke, focusing on SPY and SPX. Those are the most liquid options out there. So I like being sure. where the liquidity is there. But once I get this strategy, again, I told you it's a work in progress. Um, but once I get it to a point where it's working reliably and I'm making enough money, uh, you know, I, I would, I would hope that I would easily expand it out into like IWM and, and, uh, maybe even QQQ. Uh, there's certainly lots of room to expand. Um, so that's cool. That's, here's, that's, a that's, that's, here's a question I don't ask very often. What's your least favorite strategy? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I'm going to give a, a, a shout out to my friend, Stefan Sheplick, who's going to hate this uh, from, well, formerly from Stockwitz. He just left Stockwitz actually, but we used to work together when I worked at Stockwitz. Great kid. I love the kid. Uh, he's learned a lot since we first uh, got to know each other. But um, his favorite strategy, and it's my, and I, I yell at him every time he does this, is he loves to buy covered calls, but on mm -hmm. covered call positions. Mm -hmm. That, and for those of you who don't know, oh, look at this. Wow, you got a covered call up there. It's almost like we planned this. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. Tell me everything. So he, he loves to buy stock and sell a out-of-the-money call against that stock um, to make money theoretically on the covered call and lower his profile or his cost basis in the underlying stock. That's what people do when they're doing a covered call position. Yep. Well, I don't hate what you're trying to do. I just hate the way you're doing it. Mm. You could accomplish the same thing by in tying up far less margin and paying less in commissions, although commissions is a different topic these days with everybody lowering their commissions. Um, but with instead of selling a covered call, which means you're buying stock and then selling a call, so that's two transactions right there. Instead of doing that, you can sell a out of the money naked put and you have the exact same risk profile, you'll, you'll still lose the exact same amount of money if the stock were to sell off. You'll still make the exact same amount of money if the, if the stock goes up. However, you only had one trade. You sold a naked put. That's one less commission you got to pay. That's one less moving part you got to manage. And it ties up less buying power. For those of you who have a trading account that's maybe buying power constricted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> say, that's a great okay. phrase. <laughs> yeah. You, uh, uh, you, know, you want to have as much free buying power as possible. So selling a naked put requires less buying power. So it's the exact same risk profile. But in the end, it's going to cost you less because you're going to pay less in commissions. And commissions are the only thing you can control as a trader. Yeah, I like that. And I actually love both. I love put sales. Um, that's, that's usually what I'll do is I'll sell some puts to get into a stock if, if I like that company. And that's a, and Jeremy, that's a great strategy. If you're somebody who um, wants to be a buyer of stock, you want to you own stock, maybe you're a long-term investor, you want to you know, hold Apple or, or some other stock that you know well for a long time, instead of just going ahead and buying that stock right away, I mean, unless you think that stock is on the verge of screaming higher immediately, why not sell a put and get paid to buy the stock at a cheaper price? 
-hmm. Why not? It's a great yeah. strategy. I mean, the only way that that strategy doesn't work is if it's a stock that's just screaming higher. And we all know that stocks go up and down usually. And uh, if you've got a long-term strategy to con you know, consistently buy, sell puts to get into the stock over the long run, you're, you're going to do pretty well. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's been, it's been working well, like, like you mentioned, but it's also, you know, we're in a bull market as well. So it's going to work awesome until <laughs> someone has too many put sales and get assigned and they start freaking out. Cause well, you're crazy. right. But you know what? The flip side of that though, Jeremy, is when we do hit, hit, come into a bear market and we do have massive dislocations in stock prices where stocks get cut in half or they lose 20% in, in a short period of time. The one thing that's nice is that you'll see options premiums go very much higher because everyone's scared. Everybody's worried about losing money. So they're buying puts to protect their positions for an opportunistic options trader mm -hmm. selling puts in that type of environment. As long as you're managing your risk and monitoring your positions, selling puts out of the money puts in that environment is, can be a very high probability trade because you got two things going for you. Premiums are higher, which lowers your break even level. And because premiums are higher, you can go further and further away from the market yeah. to lower your risk of getting assigned against. Dude, that's what I've been doing on Tesla for like four years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, there's premium down there in the, in the 100s, man, on Tesla. I know. I know. And that's wonderful. And if you know what you're doing and if you size your positions properly and, and, and make sure you honor your stop loss levels, because you have to do that with naked short puts. Mm -hmm. um, if you manage your risk like that, um, you're going to come out ahead. I mean, it's almost mathematically, I hate to use the word guaranteed. So let me not use the word guaranteed, but you're mathematically advantaged to be selling far out of the money naked puts, especially when volatility is high. Yeah. Yeah. That's the key. When the volatility is up, and, you know, either, uh, do, do you look at the implied volatility on an individual stock or kind of like the broader market or a little bit of both, or do you use historical implied volatility? So the so first part of your question and the answer is absolutely yes. Volatility is probably the first thing I look at when I consider putting on a trade uh, in a stock. I look at the volatility of the individual stock. Mm. Um, I am aware of the volatility of the overall market, obviously, um, and, and I use that to inform whether I want to be putting on bullish or bearish positions just in general. But when it comes to an individual stock, what matters to me is the volatility of that individual stock, and that informs the type of trade I want to put on. So you don't have a volatility graph here on Tesla. No. It doesn't matter, but looking at this chart, if I'm looking at this chart right now and I'm thinking, okay, looks like it wants to break higher, I want to put a bullish trade on. That's my first decision. I, I decide what my market opinion is. And in this, in this case, I'm bullish in Tesla. The very next thing and the first thing I look at, I should say, is where is the implied volatility in Tesla options? And if volatility is high, meaning, and, 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 I, and I, I'm not looking at the absolute value, like the number, like what's the 0 0.0874, you know, that number is meaningless to me. I want to know where is implied volatility now compared to where it's been over the past six months to 12 months. Mm. So if it's high, if it's, if it's in the higher end of the range of where it's been for the past year, then if I want to express a bullish trade, then what I'm thinking is maybe, well, maybe I want to sell a naked put because the premiums are high. That's a bullish trade. Um, maybe I want to buy a covered call or not a covered call. I want to buy a, bull call spread, meaning I buy a slightly out of the money call, but sell a further out of the money call against it to lower my cost because the options prices are a little bit jacked because premium mm -hmm. is high. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, if I'm bullish Tesla and I see that pre, uh, options or implied volatility is very low, then that says to me, okay, well, I want to be a straight buyer of, of long calls because premiums are cheap. I'm going to buy calls and that allows me to go even further out in time because I could go maybe six to nine months out instead of three to four months because I can afford it because the options are cheaper. Yeah. And that's something that a lot of people need to remember is like if, if the implied volatility is really, really low on an option, you're going to get a really good deal. And I don't mind in those situations personally, man, I don't mind buying really far out of the money because the risk reward is so easy to manage. And since the cost of the option is so cheap, and the implied volatility is low, if the implied volatility starts spiking or the stock starts moving in your direction, then it's payday. 
Right. I, I always prefer to go longer out in time if I can. And my rule of thumb, and this is not unique to me, this is unique, this is many options traders follow this, but when I'm buying premium, in, that, in this case, buying a call, when I'm buying premium, I want to go as further out as, you know, as far as I can. I don't want to go, you know, three years out, but I definitely want to, you know, get several months under me at least. Um, and when volatility and, or sorry, that's when I'm buying a uh, premium. And when I'm selling premium, you know, selling a naked put or putting on an iron condor or something like that, I want to be putting on trades that have, that are closer to expiration, maybe, you know, four to six weeks until expiration, because I, at that point, I want the options to decay as fast as possible and options decay faster as you get closer to expiration. So if I'm putting on a short premium play, I definitely don't want to go further than say six weeks out to expiration because I want to be in that fast part of the, of the decay curve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. And have you, do you ever day trade options by any chance? Uh, not on purpose. Um, there are, <laughs> yeah. there are times when I've day traded, um, just as a risk management move. Um, but no, I, I'm not uh, certainly looked to day trade on, uh, on purpose. Gotcha. That's never my goal. I, my, 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 you know, well, with, with, with individual stocks, when I'm putting on, you know, you asked me before and I never gave you the complete answer, but you asked me, you know, what strategies I'm, I'm employing right now. We talked about what I do with a Delta neutral in SPY. Mm -hmm. That's one half of what I do. The other half is, um, I put on trades. Uh, I, one of my jobs is I work for All Star Charts. I'm the uh, I'm the options analyst for uh, the All Star Charts research platform, and we publish trade ideas, uh, options trade ideas for our subscribers. And these are trades that I put on myself. Um, and so these are all individual stock or you know options trades on individual stocks. So like Nvidia and Tesla and things like that. And with those trades, I don't have a go to strategy. I'm employing the strategy that I think offers the best chance to express our opinion in that current environment. So I go through my check down, right? Like, okay, am I bullish or am I bearish? Okay, I'm bullish. Great. What's implied volatility? Is it high or is it low? If it's high, okay, then I could do X, Y, and Z. If it's low, I'll do, you know, A, B, and C. I, I kind of have that checklist. So the strategies I employ are always different. It might be an iron condor, it might be a calendar spread, it might be a uh, risk reversal. Um, it just depends on where the volatility is and how bullish or bearish we are on the trade. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And Thomas is asking in the chat pane, do you have any other, any other specific criteria for put sales? Um, let's see. So the checklist I go through with put sales are this number one, I want volatility to be high. That's, that's the number one criteria. Volatility has got what to be classify high. as high. Um, in the upper half of its, uh, eight, it's called yearly range. Okay. But you know, I kind of look back like six to 12 months, but let's just say 12 months, keep it simple. Um, the, the upper half. Yep. Um, that's number one. The, the second thing I look for is, um, and this is just, this is me specific. This is not going to apply to everybody, Jeremy. Yeah. But for me, if it's a high priced stock, like say like an Amazon, right? Or um, I don't know, like a $150 stock or higher, I generally will not do a naked put sale only because the margin that will be required to hold a naked put in a high price stock is very high and much higher than I'm comfortable tying up for the amount of capital I have. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a $100,000 account or $500,000 account that, you're, that you've allocated options, this might not apply to you. But for me, I'm mindful of that. If it's a high price stock, I might just put a, I might buy an out of the money put just to reduce the margin requirement on it. Sure. Um, so that's maybe, yeah, that's a small step, but it's, it's an important step. So let's include that in there. Yep, makes sense. Um, the third item, and this probably the last one is, it's not something I hear to every time, but it's something I'm definitely mindful of is if I'm going to sell a naked put in a stock, I want that stock to be a stock I'm comfortable holding if I get assigned. And for me, uh, what makes me comfortable is the stock is, is one, preferably one of two things. It's either A, a large cap stock, or B, pays a dividend. Mm -hmm. Now, these are just my comfort level things, but I feel like large cap stocks and stocks that pay dividends generally 
Of course, there are always exceptions, but generally don't have, you know, surprise blowups where they get cut in half 30% overnight, which is bad news for a naked put seller. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we've all seen examples of that happening and it does happen. So it has to be, you know, if it's a stock that I want to own, that makes it a little bit easier. Um, a side, maybe a, a side caveat is I generally don't sell naked puts in, um, biotech stocks because they yeah. tend to be the ones that have the most serious gaps. Um, and also my preference, all things being equal is I'd much rather sell a naked put in an index than a stock mm, yeah. just because it's, again, it's more, more protection. You're less likely to get a massive gap against you. Um, but look, you get paid for taking on risk, right? Uh, you're, you're going to find smaller premiums in ETFs be just because of the fact that there's much smaller gap risk than you would say in Tesla <laughs> or Amazon yeah. Yeah. or uh, I don't know, some, or some biotech for that example, of sure. course, I wouldn't trade a biotech. Mm. Is there any specific amount of premium that you look for? Like 1% or just the general number? You know, that's a good question. And I get that question a lot from people that I mentor. Um, I don't hate that idea. Some people like to say, okay, I want to get paid 1% of the value of the, of the, of the stock. I don't hate that idea. Um, it's not something I do. The way I generally do it is um, I like to sell a 25 Delta out of the money put. Sure. Um, for me, um, it's like, for, I feel like it's the nice, it's a good balance between getting enough premium, but being far enough away that I likely you know, I can manage the trade a little easier. Like it's less likely to go in the money. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, so that's what I look for. I, I ideally will look for a 25 Delta out of the money put. And then the next criteria is, you know, after I've selected where the 25 Delta strike is, I'll, you know, eyeball the chart and just look like, does that level make sense? Or is there some support level that's like maybe a little bit lower than that? And maybe I should do a strike just below that just for a little bit more protection. So looking at this, yeah, you know, this Ameritrade chart is probably a bad idea, but let's, let's pretend like that massive spike down two weeks ago didn't happen. <laughs> right. And we're looking at that pullback in, uh, in August kind of, yeah, right there, right there. Yeah. So let's pretend that's the low. If I'm looking at selling a naked put and the 25 Delta put is the 45 strike, right? Where you have your cursor. I might say to myself, okay, that's 25 Delta, but maybe I should move it down to like the 42 level because that's where support came in. Maybe I'd sell the 42 strike. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. But generally speaking, I, I like to sell the 25 Delta put. Makes sense. Uh, so since I got you for almost maybe 15 more minutes, um, what the heck do you do with trade ideas? <laughs> what, what, what do you do there? <laughs> so, you know, trade ideas is a wonderful company to work for. Uh, we were a small company. We have 25 employees approximately, and uh, we're all spread out around North America. So U S and Canada, we have no physical office. Mm -hmm. Everybody works from home, including the CEO and including the managing partners. We're all, we all work from home. Um, so number one, that just works for my lifestyle. I love it. But trade ideas uh, is a company where because we're small, um, we all kind of do a little bit of everything here. Um, and I'll, I can just speak for myself. I can tell you what I don't do. I'm not a coder or a developer, so I don't, I don't build the software. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I have no skill in that department. Yeah, thank God for everyone. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the guys that are doing that work are, uh, they're working their asses off and they're, they're, they're overworked, but they're doing great work. Um, but what I do for trade ideas is a number of things. Uh, definitely I'm involved in sales. Uh, and business development. That's kind of where my main focuses are. Um, I also uh, am involved in training. Um, so I train new users on the platform. I, 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 want, I run one of our TI University classes every Monday for new people on the platform, kind of giving them the, the X's and O's, the basics of how to use the platform and how to be a little bit dangerous with it. Um, and I, I travel to conferences uh, and speak on behalf of the company. That's where I met you doing yeah. what I do for trade ideas, speaking at a conference. So I do a lot of that. Um, and we have our own conference that we put, we put on. Uh, in fact, it's coming up next week. Um, and I'm loosely involved in that. Like I've sourced many of our speakers and I work with the team to make sure everybody uh, has what we need to do. And I sold sponsorships for that. Um, so I, I have my hat uh, involved in a lot of different things here, um, which is true of everybody. 
Um, we all kind of pitch in where, wherever uh, we can add value, which is kind of one of the great things about this company is that, you know, we all kind of have like, we, we all officially have job titles, but like the job titles are like, they're nebulous. Like they, they change depending on who we're talking to. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, because we all do different things and, and we all have different skill sets and, uh, and everyone at the company is given an opportunity to shine in doing the things that they do best. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm filled with gratitude towards Dan and David, the two main partners at Trade Ideas who brought me on and continue to task me with things that, uh, you know, help me grow and help me shine and, and keep me engaged. And uh, so that's wonderful. Trade Ideas is great. Heck yeah. Do you, do you have any uh, 2020 dates yet? Uh, well, we tend to, are you speaking about Trade Ideas conferences or just yeah. any conferences? Yeah, Trade Ideas oh. conference. Well, uh, this year's our fourth annual Trade Ideas Conference, and it's traditionally been the last weekend of October every year, so probably okay. will be the same next year, although I'm going to lobby my guys to see if we can move it a week earlier, because I got a five-year-old who will be six years old next year, and that's Saturday before Halloween. There's always so much Halloween fun stuff going on, yeah. and I miss, I miss out on it every year, and I know that there's other parents in my with who I work with who probably feel the same way and uh so I'm gonna see if I can lobby to move it up a week <laughs> sure okay well either way I'll try to make that one because I know I I know we I want to do this one but I will be out of the country so. I know we uh, we invited you to come out we wanted you to be a speaker I would have loved to have you come out but hey everyone's got different things going on we get it yeah man totally well that's that's really cool is there anything you can share with trade ideas that are upcoming that would be kind of interesting or you think would be unique fun well i mean thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about them uh, we do have a couple things that are coming up like product wise um uh this is not gonna sound like great groundbreaking technology and it's not but it's different with trade ideas and that is we're soon to be rolling out a paper trading module now i know that doesn't sound sexy and it's not doesn't sound like it's changing the world but what's different with trade ideas and our uh, uh paper trading module is that within trade ideas you will now be able to paper trade algorithmic trading. So you'll be able to build your own algorithms and auto trade them. You could do that now. You could auto trade strategies and you could auto trade our artificial intelligence application that we have, that we call Holly. Mm-hmm. People now who've never auto traded before or never strategy traded before, they can use our paper trader to kind of learn how that Tinker, works. Which is smart. That's, that's great. Right. People uh, are, some people are scared of, you know, turning over their trading to a robot. Understandably so. Um, so the paper trader module will allow people to, uh, kind of dip their toes into that, which I think will be pretty cool for a lot of people. And then secondly, a big thing that's coming down the road is, uh, we're all aware of the sea change happening with, uh, commission brokers and they're all lowering their costs. And which is killer. Which is killer. Of course. Yeah. Um, we, uh, will soon be, we're working on some partnerships right now with some commission free brokers. Uh, that will allow people to auto trade direct from trade ideas and do it commission free. And that's going to be a huge game changer for everybody. Cause right now, if people use trade ideas to auto trade their strategies, the only broker currently hooked up with us is interactive brokers IB, and, IB, yeah. and a they're difficult. Let's just call it difficult to work yeah. with. Yeah. And B they charge commissions, which is pretty old school these days. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. Go Robin Hood. So that's, uh, that's some exciting stuff we got coming up with trade ideas. And, and I, if, if I could too, I'd like to give a shout out for anyone listening. If, yeah. if you are a current trade ideas subscriber, or if you're considering using trade ideas, um, one thing that we offer, uh, we offer a fantastic affiliate program where, you know, if you can get, if you get people to click on your links, if you have a social media following, if you have a website, if you've got a chat room like you do, Jeremy, uh, anything like, like this, if you have an audience, and uh, you could be a Trade Ideas affiliate subscriber or not. Um, obviously, it's better if you are a subscriber so you can show people how the product works and whatnot. But um, you could uh, drive people to your links. And if people sign up and, and subscribe to Trade Ideas, you can earn 30% commissions on every sale. That, and that adds up pretty significantly. And by the way, Trade Ideas is a monthly subscription. And for as long as that customer keeps renewing their subscription, which most do, you continue getting paid your 30% every month. Mm-hmm. Um, we have, uh, we ran, I just ran the numbers. I, had, I wrote a blog post about this a couple of months ago, but I, we ran the numbers and 
I was looking at the, the payouts that we're paying some of our affiliates. Our top five affiliates that month that I analyzed it earned uh, on average $8,000 in commission that month. <laughs> that was our top five affiliates. So we got a lot of people doing less, but hey, what's it, what, how, how would an extra 500 or 1,000 bucks a month sound to you? Sounds pretty good to me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, but that's, so, that's the cool. That's the cool thing about trade ideas is I will say like they they've leveraged and they've realized that people want to use cool things. And <laughs> if you, you know, if you uh, create it and you set it up and you have it and you're using it and everyone else is using it, like why not make some money off of it? Right. So if anyone's interested in learning more about that, I'm happy to chat. Um, I'm on Twitter. My handle is at Chicago Sean. Uh, he, he, there you go. He's going to throw it up there. That, that's the best way to reach me. Uh, reach out anytime. I'm happy to get you that information. Um, I think it's, uh, it's great for everybody. <laughs> I see Jason P just timed out. I'm from Chicago. Yo. Um, yep. Awesome. I, I lived in Chicago for 10 years. I'm not from Chicago and I don't live there anymore, <laughs> which confuses people. But uh, <laughs> when Twitter started, I was in Chicago. And so Chicago, Sean was the handle that was available to me and I took it and I've stuck with it. And and these days it's become my brand, so to speak. So I can't, can't get rid of it now. Yeah. And when you, when do you have your next uh, meetup? Cause you do meetups pretty frequently, right? Right. Uh, thanks for asking. I, so I live in Boulder, Colorado now for anyone who's, who wants to know. And, um, uh, I run a traders meetup here in the Denver Metro area, which Boulder is a part of, uh, we meet twice a month, uh, and we alternate between Denver and Boulder. Uh, we meet twice a month and, um, it's a super casual, uh, meet up where we get, um, depending on the, the place and the location, we, we, it's in a different spot every time we, we just go to different, uh, brew pubs or breweries, which are a ton of them around here. Mm -hmm. Um, we just alternate to different breweries and it's super casual. We get between 15 or 25 people show up every event, guys, girls, experienced, inexperienced, futures traders, options traders, cryptocurrency traders. We get everybody, every type of person interested in the markets. And um, look, it's just, it's just a hangout, right? We, just, we drink beers, we shoot the shit. There's no sales pitches. There's no hustle. There's no um, presentations. There's nothing. It's just traders hanging out with other traders. Mm -hmm. And I started this meetup uh, five years ago because when I moved here from Chicago, I would talk to people. You know how like when you meet people, like the first question always comes up. So what do you do? Yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I hate that question. Yeah, um, and so I would tell people I'm a trader. And the, the, the question, uh, the immediate response would, would often be, oh, where do you work out? And I said, <laughs> trader with a D. <laughs> yeah. <That's so laughs> yeah. Funny. I'm trader with a D. Look at me. Do I look like I work out? Come on now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so, I was having trouble finding people that spoke my language. I came from Chicago where in Chicago, everyone either is a trader, was a trader, has a brother who worked on the floor, has a sister who was a clerk at XYZ clearing firm. Like everybody knows somebody who worked in trading. So they understand the world. So when I'm in Chicago and I tell people I'm a trader, people just nod their head and say, Oh, cool. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. Um, but out here it was different. So I, was, I, I started this meetup group as a way to, find my people, right? Yeah. I was new to Colorado. I didn't know anybody when I moved here. Um, so I started it and it's been a wonderful experience. I've, I've made a ton of great friends in the five years we've been doing it. Um, and we get new people showing up every, every event. Um, and uh, it's look, traders, as you know, Jeremy, we see the world differently. Yeah. We yeah, think we in terms of probabilities. We think in terms of common sense. Uh, we're not easily swayed by the news. At least we shouldn't be. Um, we just have a different worldview of looking at things and interpreting things. Mm -hmm. And so at this meetup group, I'm allowed to be around people who think the way I think and have the same sense of humor and, and, and that kind of thing. And, and that's what it's all about. So if you're in the Denver area or Colorado, or even if you're just coming through on vacation, you're skiing here one, one weekend, um, hit me up on Twitter and I'll, I'll connect you with our group and you're welcome to join. And it, totally free to join. Our events don't cost any money. They're always free. Um, we'd love to have you. I'd love to meet you. Heck yeah, man. I love it. And let's, uh, I'll be in uh, Colorado in March. Yes. Yeah. So we're going to have to connect. Of course. For, yeah. I mean, I'll be, I'll be in Denver specifically. I think it's either Denver or, or Utah. I don't know yet. I'll, I'll check, but I'll, I'll be out. Uh, I'm coming out. We got to hang out at some point. Man. 
Well, you know, you and I, last time we hung out, we, we did a hike in Montreal, which sounds weird, but there's a, so there perfect. Is, that was a beautiful hike. There's a little mountain right on the edge of town there in, in Montreal, and it was a wonderful day, wonderful hike. But if you come out here, I'll take you on a real hike. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, man, for sure. We'll do. Well, hey, it's been an absolute honor and pleasure to have you. I'm going to have you back, man. Um, you're just a great guy to talk to and a great person in general, so thank you for your time. Well, the uh, sentiment is likewise, my friend. I love you, brother. Even though I just know you, I just met you. I still love you. Back and i um, happy to be on any time, my friend. All right. All right, man. Take care. All right. See ya. See ya. All right, folks. There he is. The man, the myth, the legend. So if you ever want to connect with him, you got all social media stuff. Really cool guy. Fun follow on Twitter. Just again, just a, a nice guy. I like nice traders. No agenda. Nothing to push. Just Loves the market, loves trading, loves talking about it. Can go pretty in depth, as you guys can, as you guys heard. Uh, so the only update I have, uh, as far as trading is concerned, is I'm keeping a real close eye on Square right here. Uh, this like triangle pattern looks interesting for a breakdown, and then Tesla, I've got a flip ready to go. And I'm debating on um, moving it or increasing it, but I know Tesla's been pretty strong, so I'm trying to figure out. Uh, I'm definitely gonna wait another two minutes for this candle to close, but you do have a really interesting trend line that kind of broke down, right? The low of this candle is 260.06, the low of this candle is 260.06. So there's someone trying to prop it up, so I figured if I do play it, I play an entry here, I can move up the stop a little bit, Here's what the 15 minute chart looks like. And again, the 15 minute chart looks okay. So we'll, get, we'll keep a close eye on it. Um, Cause again, it's, it is a little bit high and I'd be interested to see if we can pull down to the 50 again at some point today. But I'll be keeping a close eye on Tesla. Work day is about to trade into my target. So that's hilarious to get stopped out on that. AMD, nothing really special. And again, back over to Square, Square at 62.90. Pretty interesting little uh, little pattern here. Normally when I see things like this, I see these little moving averages, I like to try and wait for that breakdown and, uh, and then do some type of retest. So we'll keep an eye on square, but otherwise, um, you know, for those who are here in the real life day trading room, I'll be here for another 30 minutes or so. And for those who might've been listening to the recording, hey, thank you for listening in, thanks for tuning in. I try to do these every single week with someone else out there on the trading sphere of the world. And I definitely will have Sean back. He's a really cool guy. Talk more stuff. But anyway, thanks for tuning in. You guys rock. Bye-bye.